Hello everyone, this presentation is on international trade theory. We're going to be looking at two different broad types of trade theories. On the one hand, we're going to be looking at descriptive theories. So these are theories that just try to explain what patterns of trade exist, why does trade occur, what kinds of products are traded from country to country. But trade also um, garners a lot of attention from those that would like to uh, give advice about how things should go. So there are trade theories that are prescriptive in other words, they uh, address such questions as uh, to what extent should government control trade or influence trade? Uh, should there be limits on the amount of goods and services that are traded or the types of goods and services that are traded? Uh, and are there, should there be limitations on which countries are traded with? So those, those are the prescriptive theories. Um, we'll be looking at, at those as well. Actually, primarily, well, let's, let's start out with a prescriptive theory. Uh, this is mercantilism, and mercantilism is a, uh, a theory that was prevalent from about 1500 through the early 1800s or so. Um, it's really a, more of a mindset than a theory, I guess. It's how most people, both government leaders and business people perhaps, and, and uh, certainly trade theorists, thought about trade uh, during that time period. Uh, and some of the ideas of mercantilism are actually still around, as I'll highlight in just a moment. But the basic idea with mercantilism starts with a definition of wealth. The definition of wealth under mercantilism is that a, a country is as wealthy, uh, or the, the total wealth of a country is measured in its holdings of gold, primarily, or certain kinds of, of treasure. So, um, so a, a country is only as wealthy as the amount of surplus that its government has built up. Well, um, <clears throat> gold is important, or this surplus is important as a basis for national power because it's used to pay for armies or build up national institutions. It's a sign of strength for the country. Um, but... Um, well, and so what is the advice of this? If it's a prescriptive theory, what does it prescribe? Well, it prescribes that countries should export more than they import in order to amass this surplus. And we still have this terminology that is in place. This phrase, favorable balance of trade, uh, is the result of having more exports than imports. And almost universally, countries are very interested in this still to this day that they want to promote exports and they want to limit exports, uh, imports, sorry, to some degree or another uh, in order to produce this favorable balance of trade or a trade surplus. Well, of course, not every country can have a cumulative trade surplus. Some are going to have surpluses, some are going to have deficits, and together it's all going to balance out. Um, you know, whether or not a trade surplus is really something that is favorable or not is something we can call into question as well. But under this idea of mercantilism, um, that, that was the main notion, was that a surplus is good, it helps build up this, this treasure, which then strengthens the country both economically, politically, and, and militarily. All right. Um, now, how do you get to that? Remember, this age of 1500 to 1800 is an age of colonialism. And so many of the European countries following this mercantilist plan um, established colonies throughout the world, and they used these colonies as a source of cheap raw materials, uh, sometimes cheap labor. Uh, and then um, they did more value-added manufacturing within their home countries. And so the idea is you import lower value products and export higher value products, and this is going to lead to this favorable balance of trade. That's the mercantilist view. All right, um, coming along at the end of the 18th century, uh, in fact, in 1776, uh, Adam Smith published a book called The Wealth of Nations, in which he argued that this mercantilist idea is misguided that the whole notion of wealth being amassed through favoring exports over imports is uh, really an illusion and, and not something that leads in reality to greater wealth within the country because he, he begins with the starting point of redefining the notion of wealth. Wealth is not some surplus holdings of the government, but wealth 
is defined by the total value of goods and services available to the people of a given country. So the availability of goods and services represents the amount of wealth. The real standard of living is, is determined by people's ability to consume. And, um, and of course, that ties back to their incomes. But, but a, a country is wealthy to the extent that it has a wide range of available goods and services, not some government uh, treasure. So um, he builds upon that idea and says, well, trade is by definition always beneficial to the parties that are engaged in the trade. Anytime, assuming economic rationality of the parties, anytime two parties engage in a trade, they, re they exit the trade feeling better off than they did before the trade. Otherwise, they wouldn't make the trade. So uh, trade, using that definition, always leaves each party to the trade better off. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, Smith says trade should be unrestricted. Let's not try to curtail imports and promote exports. Let's encourage trade of all kinds, and the more trade we have, the better off people will be. All right, he had another really important insight, which isn't necessarily directly related to international trade, but it's certainly indirectly related. It, it plays a, an important role. Um, he highlighted this idea of specialization. So he was one of the first theorists to say that specialization in production primarily um, leads to greater efficiencies and higher productivity. Okay, And he, he did take that in terms of the international trade dimension. He took that a step further. Not only is there greater productivity, but then <clears throat> on a countrywide level, as countries specialize in the production of those goods that they are best at, that they either have a cost advantage for or are more efficient at producing or have some type of quality advantage, some, some advantage to them in producing those particular products, or we could add in services here, that as countries do that specialization and engage in more trade, that that will just supercharge the benefits. So again, leading to the conclusion trade should be unrestricted and countries should specialize as much as possible. Well, so this, this notion of absolute advantage then is traced to the idea that there are certain kinds of activities that can be, f be performed in certain countries better than they can be in, in other countries. And that then trade exists between countries on the basis of these advantages. So one country has advantages in A, B, and C, another country has advantages in X, Y, and Z, and therefore the two countries should trade those products for which they have advantages for those products which, for which they don't have advantages. All right, well, let's focus a little bit more on these advantages then. What are the sources of these advantages? Here again, we can present two categories. On the one hand, we want to talk about natural advantages. Now, these are pretty readily visible. I think if we take a few moments to think about, well, what, what are the things that contribute to what a country can do best, or what people within a country can do best, we would quickly begin to list these kinds of natural advantages. For example, the climate. This is a big one. Um, the climate dictates a lot of the kinds of products, especially in the agricultural realm, which was certainly more, even more important in the 18th century, still important today. But the types of products that you can produce effectively are often dictated by the climate, the t type of, uh, you know, it could be the, the weather itself, the, the temperature, the uh, um, length of the growing season, um, the quality of the land, all of those things that lead to um, the ability to grow certain kinds of crops and certain kinds of volumes and certain rates of productivity. So climate uh, contributes a lot to these natural advantages. We can't grow bananas very effectively here in Pennsylvania, so we have to trade for them from countries where they can grow readily, like Costa Rica. But um, Maybe we have other advantages here, such as natural resources, another part of the mix. Say in Pennsylvania, you know, we have a lot of coal available, or maybe some oil and natural gas, that we might want to trade with a country like Costa Rica for bananas that we can't otherwise get. So as we focus on those things that we have advantages for, as they focus on those things they have advantages for, 
presents an opportunity for trade, both parties are better off by specializing and trading. Now, there are some other things that come into play here with natural advantages, and you might think, well, transportation costs, that's not a natural advantage, but here I'm talking about a geographical element as well, that some countries by their very location have advantages in trade because it's easier to get to other countries, either by sea routes or overland or, or whatever. It's their location itself and the relatively lower transportation costs associated with trade to get to that place that can be a source of advantage. Um, <clears throat> all right, there are also acquired advantages, the other category here. Um, and uh, those could include things like uh, design skill. Um, so for example, uh, watchmaking. Uh, there's really no reason why the Swiss should be renowned for watchmaking uh, from a natural advantage standpoint. In other words, you know, it's not access to certain key uh, resources or materials or, or a certain climate that dictates the skill in making watches, but it's a carefully uh, developed design skill over numerous generations and years that has been honed um, and has led to an advantage in that particular type of product or perception of advantage there. Um, process technology could also come into play um, and I would also add to this things like infrastructure investment um, or even just the social uh, environment and including business climate regulatory environment. Uh, there are a lot of things that we could add into that that make certain locations around the world attractive for certain types of activities and they become hubs in those kinds of industries and, and that's largely through an acquired advantage rather than through some type of a natural advantage. Alright, um, so that that's absolute advantage. Now just to highlight one more quick thing, a, an extension from Adam Smith's line of thinking. It's, it's great to say that, oh yeah, trade is good, specialization is good, and countries then trade with, with other countries uh, on the basis of these advantages that, that exist. Okay, that all makes common sense. It's a good insight from Adam Smith, and it's, it's easy to understand. Now the implication there is, though, that if those advantages don't exist, if, if mutually beneficial advantages don't exist, then trade won't occur. Um, now, a, a, another economist after Adam Smith came along by the name of David Ricardo, and he questioned that conclusion. Uh, and, and he began to develop a theory which he called comparative advantage, which states that gains from trade will occur even when a country has no absolute advantages with its trading partners. Okay, so you could have a country that has all the advantages and another country that has no advantages whatsoever. And Ricardo says, hey, there will still be gains from trade that can be shared with both countries, even under those circumstances. Okay, now that's a little bit more of a logical stretch. It's not necessarily intuitive as absolute advantages. And so what I want to do is work through an example of comparative advantage, a simplified example to show you exactly how it's going to do. So that's what I'll do in the next presentation.